What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. Welcome back to America Trends. Larry Rifkin, along with John Krofsik. And John, have you ever been involved in a family business? No, I can't say that I have. We don't really, we didn't really have a family business per se. No, John and sons. No, no, <laughs> no. Marilyn and daughters. No, no. none of that. Nothing. <laughs> it's really interesting because I always find that uh, when you think about family business, you always see and sons, right? But you rarely see and daughters. Is that going to be changing? I bet you it is. Okay. I bet you it I'm is. looking for that. I did see it in New York on the Lower East Side recently. It was a great delicatessen called Russ and Daughters. I like that. I really did. Well, I did a documentary years ago. Executive produced it for public television. And, John, we called it Someday All This Will Be Yours. Ah. And it's a really interesting thing because... I learned even in this podcast, or maybe relearned, I had forgotten, we did that documentary about 15 years ago, that the majority of businesses in America, mostly small, some large, right. Johnson & Johnson, or <laughs> I guess C.S. Johnson, or all the other Johnsons, uh, but they uh, are family businesses. Some right, of the biggest right. ones start out, well, look at Murdoch, and Fox, right, right, and News right. Corp, and all of that. So some big ones, mostly the little ones. And the fact is that there is a lot of emotion tied up with a lot of very practical, pragmatic things. And that can be a really interesting elixir when you try to put family dynamics together right. with the running of a business. Yeah, that's got to be tough because just... Uh Especially depending on the age of the kids, you know how it can be. <laughs> and look, maybe your oldest son is adult, and but yet you are expected to be turning things over to the oldest, right. and you say, wait a minute, the youngest child's the one who really should be running He'd this operation. Like it, right. yeah, I mean, so what do you do in that case? I don't know. That's a good question. Now, in your family, John, not to get personal... <laughs> But you have three children. Yes. I mean, if you were to turn over the reins of Krofsik Enterprises, which doesn't exist, folks, so don't worry <laughs> about it. Uh, I mean, how would you look at that? I mean, I mean, well, you know, as far as business goes, I think my daughter is ah. the one that has she could run a business herself without a problem, you know. And the boys? Uh, and the boys, well, they, they could be good workers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hear that. Uh, I hope they're not listening. How about but... in your household? We'll make trouble there. Well, they're both very interesting and wonderful yeah. personalities, successful in their own right. Um, I don't know how that would work. Uh, they're both very independent-minded, uh, so I'm not certain how they would work my, together. I, I find my daughter is, is more, she's a better organizer. She's, I think she would be better at, at running a business, I think. It's well, John, there are so many decisions that come about when you have a family business. I mean, who's going to be, say, the CEO or the coming CEO? When do you give up the reins? What are the others going to do, head of marketing, human resources? Uh, what if one of them underperforms? How do you right. discipline? How do you find value? And what do you do in terms of compensation? Do you treat them any differently? And then, of course, you have other professional staff in many of these cases who are not family. Right. And they're looking in saying, hey, wait a minute. I've been a good soldier for you <laughs> for 30 years. You got the wrong last name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, I had nothing to do with why I can't get ahead in this company. So, And then the other issue, of course, there are so many businesses today in America, John, where the baby boomer is, in fact, on the verge of retiring. I mean, think about this. This is dramatic. And how many of those businesses, when they're turned over to the next generation or the next generation, actually succeed? Uh, many of them do fall by the wayside because that transfer uh, is not successful yeah, from well, one I think, generation. I, yeah, I think, uh, right. I think I, I've seen it in, in a few businesses that 
you know, the kids just don't know how to run it. Like, like, the or that's did. not their interest. Or, or right, what about right. you push them into the business? Yeah. We've got a group here in Connecticut in our area, and they're running a successful oil business. Uh, but they are really musicians. That's what they really want to do. <laughs> and so some are, I think, more involved than others in the business. But right. they all have a title, you know, president, vice president, right, whatever right. it may be. So it's a tricky, tricky it is thing. Very tricky. So here we are on the verge, and we like to look at trends, John, of a large generation getting ready to hand it all over to the next generation. And it's definitely a struggle, a challenge. And we found somebody, Henry Hutchison, who works with these family businesses, who understands all of this. And it's a fascinating topic. It really is. Whether you have one of those small businesses that is family involved or not, I think you're going to love this podcast. I really enjoyed because I had so many questions to ask him. The book that he's written is called Dirty Little Secrets of Family Business, Ensuring Success from One Generation to the Next. And that's next here on America Trends. <laughs> With us on the line on America Trends is Henry Hutchison, and he's written a book called Family Business, The Dirty Little Secrets Of. And uh, I find this really interesting because I don't think, Henry, people understand what percentage of businesses in America we have to typify as a family business. And give us your definition of a family business. Well, you know, the definition of a family business is any business that's family-owned, run, or managed. Interestingly, a lot of the work that I do, the reason the family business matters is that you've got a group of people that are working together who care a lot about each other. I mean, family is definitely that way, but I will tell you that it extends beyond that. I've had numerous clients that are simply partners that all grew up together, and as they go through this process, they want to make sure that they keep their relationship intact even though they may not actually be blood relatives, it's really that caring about each other that, that really matters. But families, I mean, there's a lot of emotion <laughs> invested in everything you do. And I know that's one of the reasons that a lot of these businesses are very successful, because you would never think about not working as hard as possible for mom, dad, your sister, whatever it may be. So that trust factor is always there. But it also adds some complications along the line. Well, and you really hit the nail on the head with the trust factor. That's one of the little things that I do when I'm presenting is I alert everybody to the fact that family businesses that perform well outperform non-family businesses on a number of financial metrics. And the big question is why? So there's, there's lots of reasons why. One of the big ones is long-term planning. So if I'm a dad and I've got kids, I can make investments that I know won't pan out for a number of years because, you know, it's my own business and I know it's going down to my kids anyway. And so I'm not worried about a quarterly return. I'm worried about making sure that the business goes on forever and ever. Another interesting aspect is that with a family business, if you have some kind of immediate issue or immediate opportunity, you can rally the troops and get in a room and hash it out. And then an hour later, say, all right, we're going left. And everybody turns the boat left. I used to work at IBM, and they're a phenomenal company, but to try to get a decision made on a big decision could take months and months in order to get there. So that's obviously they can move quickly if they want. But the interesting thing is that the highest correlation, as you mentioned, is trust. And a lot of people think that's psychological mumbo-jumbo, mm -hmm. and it sounds like that. Um, but let me ask you this. What happens to family businesses where there is no trust? Those are the ones that fall apart, Yeah, right? And then, of course, there's long-term damage, perhaps, in the relationships among siblings or, you know, parent to child. I mean, I, it can be very naughty, very complicated. I mean, here we are in America today, and we're looking at a family, a family business, uh, the Trump business. I mean, how much should we learn from that experience about trust and uh, the fact they do seem to be pretty close? I will say that. You know, I, I don't know a lot about it, but it certainly appears to me that uh, everybody's saluting the flag and doing what following orders, which actually brings us to, you know, I'll, I'll digress to another aspect of family business. When you have a family business that's founded by a founder, it typically occurs because, you know, somebody had their back against the wall, they were unemployed, or maybe they saw an opportunity and they gave it a shot, they borrowed some money, they worked hard, they got some lucky breaks, and they mm. started a business. It goes along, it grows, you drag your family in, your kids, 
And what do your kids do? Dad doesn't really know why it works. He just says, look, just do what I do and because it seems to work. Then when you get to that second generation, you ask them, you know, why are you successful? They always answer, well, we just do what dad told us to do. The problem is that once you get to the third generation, they're disconnected with their grandfather. Mm. And now you kind of need to start laying down rules and parameters and policies and governance to kind of define what is it that we do well and how do we do it and let's make sure that we do it in a repeatable way. I don't know, from the Trump perspective, looks like uh, looks like his kids are following suit behind their father at this point. Well, I have a friend who trained to be an accountant, but he went into the family business and he said, number one, he could never really satisfy his father. His father had a certain way of doing things and he didn't do them the same way. Having said that, when he came into the business, uh, it was making about 300000 I mean, when he took over and began to run it, many years later, it was a $3 million business because he had a business background, a very different perspective on the business than his father. But his father, of course, took the risk at the beginning. I'm not certain my friend would have necessarily, but he certainly knew how to grow it. So what do we find about the second generation? Because oftentimes, I think the parent wants them to get a different kind of education than they had. You know, you've hit on two really interesting points, if I can keep them in my head. Point number one is that many times the first generation gets hung up, as I mentioned before, do it like I'm doing it, right? And sometimes they get into trouble because the current generation is very reluctant to allow the next generation to do it any differently than they've done it because that's all they know. They tried other things and they don't work. However, the fact of the matter is is that there's two big elements. Element number one is your kid is going to be different than you. I mean they're going to need to have work ethic and discipline and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, they're different people, and they're going to probably have a different style, and they're going to be better at certain things than others and so on and so forth. That's number one. Number two is the world evolves. The market evolves. Customers evolve. Everything's evolving. And so it's not doing it the way it was done. It's being able to – react to the marketplace intelligently, right? So that's some of the work that I do is helping the current generation realize that their kids may do it differently, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily doing it wrong. Mm. The, other, the other aspect is you've hit on, amazingly, a, a really interesting point. There are a lot of family businesses where the second generation, given the mind that, you know, I'm the second generation, you look at your dad, you kind of stand on that platform, you kind of learn the ropes of the way that they do it, and now you typically have a little bit better education. You go get a business training, so on and so forth, and you, are, you start to look at it more strategically, and you can take a $300,000 business to a $3 million business. And we find that happens a lot as long as the current generation can kind of let go at some point and the next, you don't stifle the next generation's eagerness and entrepreneurialism to say, hey, I want to take this and grow it even further. Aren't we at that point for many of these small businesses? Again, 70% of all businesses, you tell us in your book, Dirty Little Secrets of Family Business, are family businesses. And I would imagine that a lot of baby boomers, well, they might be even second generation, leaving it to the third at this point. How difficult is it to leave it all behind. Oftentimes I see where the founder is somewhere still in the picture. <laughs> I mean, as long as they're physically able, they want to be there to some extent. Are they helping or is it best to kind of break it and let the next generation take over? So Larry, you've hit on a really good point. Um, and let me back up and give you the Henry Hutchison Family Business USA theory of the things that have to occur in order to transition your family business. Number one is the next generation has to be sufficiently interested and capable or at least have the potential to get there um, in order to make it work. But the second piece is the current generation has to be willing to step back enough to let the next generation get their hands on the wheel and get their hands on what really controls the business so that we can, A, figure out whether or not they're truly capable of doing this thing, and B, You'll be here. You'll be here to guide them and see that this thing continues to go through. You're not going to know that until you actually hand over the keys to the kingdom. A lot of folks obviously have a psychological issue with doing that because they love doing this thing. They're really good at it, and so on and so forth. 
However, well, let me finish my thought there. The third piece of the gates are if you can do that, now can the next generation get along well enough together to run the business? If your brother and sister and cousin can't get along well enough together despite the fact that they're bright and motivated, it's not going to work then. But coming back to the current generation, a lot of folks, they've spent such a long time doing this work, and they are so good at it, and they're so known for doing this thing that they have a hard time imagining a world where they're not doing this thing. Number one, number two, they can't imagine anybody doing it as well as, that, as well as they do it. And there's a lot of family businesses that go by the wayside simply because dad is unwilling to let them get their hands on what really controls the business. And then when you finally hand it over, the next generation is in their late 50s, and they're thinking about retiring. So it's one of the things that we work with with family businesses with the current generation is to help them understand that you got to hand over the controls, but once you know that the next generation is capable and they're doing it, there's no reason you can't re-engage, keep your office, be the ambassador, as we like to say, and you can do projects. You can run a division. There's multiple places you can go and things that you can do. We don't want to throw you out the door, but we need to kind of go through this hole of saying, look, we need you to step out so we can run it, and once we know that's happening, hey, then jump on with us and we'll run this business together. It's just that you're in the back seat and I'm in the front seat. The book, Dirty Little Secrets of Family Business. What about this? Let me posit this. I love Johnny. Johnny's a great kid. He's my kid. But he couldn't run a lemonade stand. I mean, what do you do there? Well, the easy answer is to identify that way up front. In many of the articles that I've written and in my book and what I tell people is, you know, when you've got this business and you've got young kids, bring them into the business with zero pressure, zero expectations. You know, let them work in the summers, let them work there during the holidays, so on and so forth, just to get acclimated to it, to see if they're interested, but at the same time to see if they have a proclivity to this thing, right? So you might find as you go along that they're really not cut out to do this thing. Just because they're not cut out to do this thing doesn't mean they're not extremely good at doing something else. But I mean, our goal as parents is to have our kids have a happy, healthy, productive life, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be at the family business. That's, that would be really nice, but I'd rather have my kid be happy doing something else than miserable working in my family business. So sometimes, many times, you can vet that out right there at the beginning and say, hey, look, son, you know, you're 18, you're 21. I know you've worked here, but this really doesn't seem to be your thing. Let's go see if we can work together to find what your thing is, and, you know, I'm your father. I'm going to help you. Now, the next step is once they graduate their education, whatever that may be, it's best for them to go work somewhere else for a couple of years. That helps them mature as an individual, number one. Number two, it helps them come to grips with the idea, do I really want to go work for my family business or do I not? If they do, since they've worked somewhere else, they're going to be much better for it. But nonetheless, if you find your child is in your business, and I've, got, I've always got clients like this, that they're not really performing, typically deep down, it means that they're not happy doing this. They're just mm-hmm. afraid to go try to find something that they are willing to do. But you need to unfortunately pretty much put down some professional parameters and say, look, we can go hire somebody from the outside to do this job and pay them less for what you're doing. Do you really want me to just give you money to kind of bang around at this business for the rest of your life, or wouldn't you be better going somewhere else? But you have to remember, I'm your dad. I'm going to help you. I can introduce you to people. I can help you get education. I can help you transition your career because, hey, this really doesn't seem to be your thing. It's easy, but you're better off than not doing it. Henry Hutchison is with us. Henry, is it more often the case that the child wants in on the business or that the father or mother really wants them to follow in their footsteps. What do you find more often is the case? I think it's kind of a 50-50 deal. I'll tell you a funny story, though. There was a family business where the things were not working out and they were bumping along and so on and so forth. And then once you get with the son, he's like, you know, the only reason I'm here is because dad wants me here. And then you go to the dad later on and say, the only reason I've kept this thing going is because my son wants it. They just never got together long enough to realize that neither of them really wanted to do this thing. They were too busy, worried about what each other's feelings were. You find both. 
I mean, you find it when typically, obviously, you find it with, you know, children who are are not high performers, don't have a lot of ambition. They know they need to have money to live, and it's easy to hide out in the family business. And so you find that a lot. I, I really want to be here, and I think I'm really good at this because I'm related to you, but they're really not. And a lot of times when they do that, they will pull the wool over dad or mom's eyes, and they'll go, gosh, he really wants to do this, even though he's not very good at it. But you also find that a lot of times in the first generation to the second generation, many first-generation businesses occurred because dad was broke. Dad didn't have any money. Dad grew up poor. Right. And then dad figured out that we can do this thing and make some money, and then there's this, I don't want my kid to suffer like I did mentality, and they give them, they pay them too much, they give them the easy route, they give them titles, and then they push them into this career that... They wanted them to have everything that they didn't have, and it ends up not working out that well sometimes. I don't want to be flippant about this, but uh, John and I have done a lot of podcasts about the uncertainty of work going forward. So I could say flippantly, uh, well, at least you never have to ask, will my son or daughter ever get a job? (laughs) Because you can provide them with that uh, surety. But having said that, is that going to lead us to a place where a lot of these uh, young folks because of AI automation, all the dislocation, all the hostile work environments in America, that there's no better place than being part of the family still. Larry, you must have read my book in great detail because you keep asking me these questions. (laughs) I I contend at the very front of my book that AI, robotics, offshoring, so on and so forth, there there is a global question of what work will there be in the future? There is now avatar with avatars and artificial intelligence. There are therapists, psychotherapists, who are doing a better job of applying therapy to PTSD, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans than actual PhD professional psychologists for a variety of different reasons. Point being is that many of the jobs that are out there today are going away because of offshoring or artificial intelligence or because of robotics. So what does that have to do with a family business? What that has to do with a family business is that if you happen to own your business and you happen to be in an industry where you're making some good money and the industry is going to continue going forward, you may be able to sell that thing for quite a bit of money. But how much value would you place on having a goose that lays golden eggs? If you just pay attention to that goose, it will lay eggs for you and your family and your grandkids and your family for generations and generations. Now, you can use that goose and say, hey, I'm going to train my kids to run the business so that they'll have somewhere to go and something to do. But at the same time, you will have the resources to say, hey, maybe this isn't for you. But let's go get you trained in an area where there are job opportunities and you can go make a living. So that's how I look at it is that a family business is a very valuable resource. And if you can make that thing work, it's worth it to keep that thing going because it will be – you have control over your destiny when you, have, when you own a resource that generates money for you and your family. Absolutely. I want to take a little bit of a detour, and it's kind of a a jocular one, but until recently, and I've said this to others, I've always seen and sons, you know, Joe and sons and John and sons or whatever, but never and daughters until recently in New York City. uh, My son lives near a great delicatessen called Russ and Daughters. But how rare is that? Because you remind us that perhaps more family businesses are run by women than men. They are. And family, you know, obviously not to get too historical on you, but my family had a business. My grandfather founded a business, and my grandparents had four kids, my uncle, my uncle, my aunt, and my mom. And this is – they started the business in the Depression era, post-Depression era, and my uncles were working there, but my mother and my aunt did not because women did not do that back in the day. They did not work. It's really only post-World War II time frame that women have kind of come into their own and said, hey, men have come into the realization that women can do this stuff, right? Stupid us. And now they're starting to make lots of progress, not enough progress. But interestingly, I think it's like 3% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are female. 
but 25% of family businesses have female CEOs. Mm. So the interesting thing is that when it comes to a family business, and I've seen this in very male-oriented industries, that, hey, we don't really care. When I die, my wealth is going to go down to my kids anyway, and if you're interested and good at this business, we can keep the business and you can run it. And so I don't really care if it's my son or my daughter, just so long as you're capable of running it. Yeah, we don't see that, and daughters, very often on the uh, signs that we see uh, about a family business. Let me ask you about two of your maxims. Avoid overpaying family members and don't hire relatives if they are unqualified. How often in a family business do you have the nephews, the cousins, the nieces, all kind of knocking at the door saying, oh, I couldn't get a job elsewhere, but Uncle Bob will help me out? Well, there's a multiplicity of questions in there. My philosophy is this. You do have this resource, right? And if you're looking for a job, if there's a possibility, then I, you get the opportunity to interview. Now, you've got to be sufficiently capable to come do this thing. So I know I, I love this one family business example where the dad had a business, had four kids. Two of the boys worked there. The other two daughters did not. But the one daughter married a man who was extremely bright and motivated. Turned out that the son-in-law ended up being the guy that ran the business in the next generation. And the son was a mid-level sales manager, and the other son worked on the factory floor. That's because that was the extent of their skill level. So, yes, we'd like to use the family business if you're in dire straits and we've got an opportunity that doesn't mean you get to run the company, though. We're only going to let you go. We only let anybody go as far as their capabilities are, right? Mm -hmm. That's where you run into a problem. To the first part of my question, what about overpaying family members? This is a very complex topic. This is one of the major issues with any family business. But here's my philosophy. You want to pay your family members relative to a market rate, right? Mm -hmm. However, you know that you're, you're in your... Your wealth, when you die, is going to go to your kids. And so at a minimum, from a tax perspective, if you're going to give them a little family incentive on top of that, let's call it 10%, mm -hmm. I view that as okay. But you've got to make sure that everybody understands what that is. Market rate is X, but we're going to go ahead and pay you 10% more because, A, we'd like you to be here. Um, number two, I'm going to be giving you some money anyway because I'm your parent. But the tricky thing is this. I'm gonna, you're going to overpay the first child who comes into – you're going to bring the first child in, and you're going to pay them. Now the second child is coming into the business saying, hey, I want to get paid, but my sister gets paid. And the answer is, that's great. I understand that. However, what you're going to get paid is relative to the position that you have and the performance that you perform, and then you can have a family kicker on top of that. So if somebody's running the business and somebody else is on the factory floor – they're not going to get paid the same amount of money. You're going to get paid what that job pays, and if there's a little family bonus on top of that, that's great. And if you outperform, there's a little more money in it also. Where families need to understand where the money comes from is in the ownership, right? If mm -hmm. we're all equal owners and you got a president and a vice president and a, somebody who does blueprints and somebody who works on the factory floor, our salaries are very different. But at the end of the year, we're going to take the profit – and we're going to divide it. We're going to take what the company needs, and then we'll divide the rest up in four different ways. And that's how that's supposed to work. Dirty little secrets of family business. There's a few things that uh, you said in your book that I'd love for you to amplify on. Happy families are all alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. What does that have to do with running a family business? First of all, it's, it's a quote, so it's interesting, but um, the real point there is this. I've, I've spent you know, a couple decades – I grew up in two family businesses, both sides of my family. I studied psychology. I got a degree in, in management. I've been a consultant, and I've been working with family businesses for the last you know, 12, 15 years or so. So there's a lot of information out there on best practices that should be employed things you shouldn't do, and there's a lot of examples out there on what went right and what went wrong that we can look at. However, the situation in every particular family business is unique to that family business, and the answers that need to 
be created for that family business are unique to that family business. We're all individual people. We all have individual hopes and dreams and goals and situations that we're in. And so there is no cookie-cutter approach. There is no magic tool or wand I can pull out and wave over a family business that's having problems. The, pro the, the answer to any family business problem is something that has to be created through and from their own particular situation. You also say the family is about unconditional love and business is about profit. So when those two come into conflict, what does that spark? That, that sparks the fundamental issue of family businesses. You know, you've got a business, and the point of being in business is to make money, to make profit at the end of the day. That's why you do this thing, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Well, you try to deliver the best product or service you can at a reasonable cost, at a reasonable time, better than your competitors. And again, we all know that you can go get your – MBA from Harvard Business School, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be successful. I liken it to some football players. You can take the, the top college football recruit out of college and you put them in the pros, and for some reason they just don't make it, right? They mm -hmm. should have made it, but we don't know why. Some do, some don't. So business is part science and part art, but the goal invariably is we need to make money. At the bottom line, we're going to, we're going to, have, we're going to have money that comes in, and then we're going to have costs that go out. And what's left over is profit. When it comes to family, this is your brother, your sister, your mother, your grandfather, your kids. You will always love them no matter what. And they're always going to be your family. And that's just the way that is. You there know, are no conditions for that. One thing I didn't tell Pardon. you, Henry, and I probably should have yep. told you this at the beginning. Uh, years and years ago, uh, when I was head of programming for public television in Connecticut, we did a documentary. And it was called Someday All This Will Be Yours. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was funded mm -hmm. by Mass Mutual, and it was all about yeah. the transfer. You did see it? No, but Mass Mutual did a lot. To st probably 20 years ago, they were very big in the space and sponsored a lot of things like this. Exactly. They had a film, in fact. That may have been their film. It was. Someday all this will be yours. So the question is, what are all these transitional issues that you as a consultant and that these very specialized companies help family businesses do that may be apart or distinct from other types of businesses? It's a good question, um, and it really backs up to the original discussion that we were just having, is that you know, business about making money, but family's about unconditional love and support. The goal when somebody like myself and folks like Mass Mutual and, and folks that work with family businesses realize is that it's about preserving the wealth that's being created from the business by the business and it's maintaining harmony in the family. So there's this balancing act that has to go on here. And so the tricky thing is to align is to align your family, who you're always going to love, and align them up with who's appropriate to work in the business, even though we're all owners. How do you divide up the ownership and do all of this, make all of these decisions so that they're fair and equitable and reasonable, and you're getting everybody on the same page so that everybody's feeling comfortable in the family with whatever their position may be. So a lot of that, from my perspective, is trying to get maybe the next generation child to understand that, hey, I know that you think you may be capable of running this business, but you're really not. And let's try to get you aware of that. And let's try to get you comfortable with that. Maybe dad's in the same position. Maybe it's a position where the next generation is the one that really is capable and dad's been bumping along at this thing and not doing well. I have to tell dad that, hey, your level of performance is really not good and we need to move more of this to your kids. It's not the kind of thing where you're actually instructing them to do these things. But that's, that's why what we do is so unique, is that we're trying to create family harmony under this difficult situation of also running a business. Absolutely. I get calls from all sorts of professionals saying, hey, they're arguing with each other. I'm getting out. I'm going to send you in now. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. You did say that entitlement is the family business killer. It is, and it's, it's one of the family businesses, if not attended to carefully, have a tendency to create entitlement in the next generations. You've got a business. It's making money. 
by definition. And if you're owning and running a business, you probably have some employees um, whose livelihood you control. Um, you also, as an owner, you can decide I'm kicking off at 3 o'clock. You can decide I'm going on vacation next week. You have the flexibility to do whatever you want to do because you happen to own this thing. Well, your child sees this growing up that dad has money, dad controls the employees, dad can take time off, and dad has some money. And so it's very easy for the next generation, if not attended to, to think, hey, I'm wealthy, my dad has control, I am also important. In reality, that is not true. The world judges us by our own individual merits, not by who we know or what we have. And if a parent lets that, because you have a family business, your kids can gain a sense of entitlement. And if you're not, and then if you bring them into the business at a higher level than they should be, you don't start them at the bottom, you pay them too much, you tell them they're going to be great, now you're going to have a problem on your hands down the road. As a consultant in this area, am I correct that this is a moment, an inflection point, where there is a lot of transfer going on from the baby boom generation to the millennial? And what is the impact going forward on the American economy if so many businesses are, in fact, uh, family-rooted? Well, you know, it's actually an even bigger question than that, and it's true. There is The baby boomers are the largest proportion of humans on earth as, a, as an age group. You know, we all baby boomers, the, the babies that were born after World War II, and I'm 55. I was born in 64, and so I'm the last of the baby boomers, and I'm just 55. So we've only just now started really getting into this transition. So there's a, a ton of people who own businesses between the ages of 55 and 75 who are going to need to do something with this business. And so those those business owners who have children in the business, they're going to have to start pushing a large amount of these family businesses over. So my business is going through the roof. I'm getting calls all the time because it keeps going up and up and up. However, the really interesting thing is this. There has always been, there always will be a generational gap. If you've got a mother and a father and they've got children, um, the perspective and the viewpoint of how uh, the mother and the father grew up is going to be different than the child because it's a different time. It's a different time. It's a different era. Things change. And so there's a different perspective. You know, there's rock and roll and there's the 60s and so on and so forth. There's always a generation gap. However, because the baby boomers came out of it, there's so many of them. There's a largest amount of them, number one. Number two, they come from an era that we know sacrifice from World War I, World War II, the Great Depression. We didn't necessarily live through it, but we know it because we feel it from our parents. The millennials, they don't know war. They don't know sacrifice, and it's, not, it's wonderful. I'm glad they haven't had to experience all of that, but they're unaware of that, and so they don't, they're, they're not afraid of things going wrong, um, and so they have a different attitude. But the really big thing is that you take that and you compound it with the Internet, and smartphones, and Google, and artificial intelligence, robotics, so on and so forth, they live in a very different world than us baby boomers. So there's a, an enormous communication chasm between the philosophy of business between the traditional baby boomers and the you know living on the internet, smartphone, work 24-7, Facebook, Instagram, millennials. And what I will tell you is that I believe that we, while we struggle with it, they are preparing themselves to go into a future that us baby boomers really can't comprehend. Absolutely. So maybe it is a good time uh, to hand it over. Dirty Little Secrets of Family Business, ensuring success from one generation to the next. Henry Hutchison. And I find this a, a fascinating topic in a way, in a, in a phantom way. Uh, I went into a family business. My father was a radio station manager, but he died before we had the opportunity to work together, though I think we would have. But um, he certainly inspired me to be doing what it is that I've done my entire life. So in some way, I had some of the benefit of it, uh, but without the opportunity to interact with my dad throughout my adult life. But uh, Thank you for sharing your insights, which are certainly uh, substantial in this field. Thanks for coming by on America Trends today, Henry. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. America Trends podcast is part of the MHNR Network. MHNRnetwork.com.